Uh, oh boy. View full screen mode. Okay, so let me see. This is the right. Yes, okay. Okay, so I'll start this uh, <clears throat> Tuesday lecture. Welcome everybody, and it's a pleasure to, to continue this, this, this lecture series on data science. Oh, it says data mining. Well, <laughs> it's data science. I believe the title. Um, anyway, so um, uh, yeah, so just as a comment, so data mining was a term that was, was used commonly for, for what is nowadays talked uh, uh, referred to as data science. So we we uh, we used this name data mining before, but uh, you know people are talking about more data science nowadays. Although data mining is a term which is still appearing. So so we were talking last week about um, LDA and so linear discriminant analysis. As I said, uh, maybe in the beginning of this this, this uh, part of the lecture earlier. So linear discriminant analysis was uh, originally developed in in the statistics framework by by Ronald Fisher, and so so he used uh, as a starting point uh, the assumption that you are looking at um, clouds of of, of of points which are uh, distributed normally with different uh, means and and covariances. But so here we make no reference to that sort of. Uh, Ideas. So, so we. I, re I repeat quickly what I did last time, and then uh, then I continue. So we have the data set, which consists of p vectors in R n, and we assume that this data set is uh, divided into disjoint sets, which I refer to as clusters or groups. And uh, so then we have the annotation. So we know which vector belongs to which group. And so this annotation vector i j tells me that if uh, the jth component of i is l, it means that the jth data vector belongs to the to the group l, dl. Question is, if we want to reduce the dimensionality and look at the data, projecting it to a lower dimensional space, is there a way to do this projection in such a way that the cluster structure of the data is revealed? So that's the question. And so, so the question was uh, sort of, um, um, summarized in this picture. So if you have these two uh, cluster data, you have green points and red points, and then you are doing the principal component analysis of this, you find this direction which is indicated by the blue dashed line. And when I'm cal calculating the components of my data to, to that direction and make a histogram, so now my reduction, data reduction is not a, um, you know, uh, scatter plot but it's a, it's a histogram because it's a one dimensional redux, reduction so you see that the red and green histograms are overlapping and so this direction that pca gives you is not really good at revealing the the cluster structure of your data so the question is would you be able to define another type of criterion that reveals the, the cluster structure and so the idea here was that we were, were defining the the spread of uh, of the components so why is that why why are the components of my data into direction Q? And so then when you look at the spread, you realize that the spread, which was defined as the square sum of the components, can be represented as a, as a quadratic form, Q transpose SQ, where S is called a scatter matrix. And so this is an N by N matrix that looks pretty much like a, like a, a covariance matrix if you if you come from statistics. So. So what we do now, we are sorting our uh, data into these uh, sub-matrices X1, X2, etc., XK, where each XL is containing the data from one and only one cluster. And so then what we did, we calculate the cluster centers, CL. So each cluster has its own, own center. And then I'm centralizing each one of those clusters. So I'm subtracting the center from each data vector belonging to that particular cluster. And so you can think geometrically that I'm moving my my um, data around the origin. So so here is a picture where I have three clusters, the red, blue and the green one. 
And so I'm calculating the cluster centers, which are the black dots in, in the middle of the cluster. And then I'm moving my, my points, uh, pulling them around the, the coordinate origin. So now I have sort of lost the, the specificity of the data. So everybody is, is, is centered at the origin. And so why do I do this? Well, um, I'm defining the uh, within cluster scatter matrix. So I'm, I'm measuring how widely scattered the data is after I move it around the origin. And so since I'm trying to make a projection or calculating components into a direction where the, where the data looks as clustered as possible, so I want that this spread defined by SW, which is the within cluster uh, spread defined by the within cluster scatter matrix as small as possible so that my data looks clustered. And however, I want to separate those clusters. So therefore, I'm uh, measuring the spread of the uh, cluster centers. And in order to do that, I'm defining this XL bar, which is just the repetition of the of the cluster center. So I'm basically replacing each data point in my cluster by its cluster center. So I'm sort of making the data rather trivial here. And so then I'm calculating the, the um, global center C, which is the global center of all data. And then I'm centering these uh, X bar. So I'm defining a new vector X bar C, which is uh, uh, the, the X bar data and the center removed. And so here is the picture. So first I take all these three clusters and I'm collapsing the clusters into one single point. So now my blue cluster is represented by the, the blue dot here, the red cluster by the red and the green by the green dot. And so these are the clusters. So, so now I have repetitions, but you don't see in this picture because they are all one on top of the other. And so then I'm looking at this, this reduced trivialized data and I'm asking what is the what is the spread of that data? So I'm defining the, the between cluster scatter matrix, which is measuring how far apart these, these cluster centers are from each other. And, uh, and so now if I want to have a project. Excuse me, Professor. Yep. Uh, we can't uh, we can't see the paper and pages. You you can see the pages presentation your presentation. Oh, you cannot see my 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 page. Because you don't uh, share it. Yes, no, I but can see no, I can see I can see I, it I cannot them see, correctly. Yeah. yeah. So the the pages are going on. All the slides are yeah. moving. I can see them correctly. Me too. Yeah, my my computer said that I'm sharing it, so I. Uh, yes, but you are, you are sharing your desktop, so we can also see your uh, slides moving, going on. So it's it's correct. So is it okay if I continue? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. So so you see that I'm I'm. Uh, you see this picture now, is that? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, okay, I hope the, the, the problem is resolved. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so yes. Um, good, so we have these, uh, these uh, uh, scatter matrix of the, of the centroids. And so what we, of course, want to do when we want to separate these these clusters, we want that the centroids are are separated as uh, much as possible. Okay, so so therefore now we have a sort of a dual uh, uh, objective. So we try to find the direction Q so that the within cluster spread is as small as possible, so that the the clusters appear as compact as possible. On the other hand, we want that the centroids appear as far away from each other as possible. So the so the 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 between clusters spread is large as possible. And so the idea was this uh, multiple, let's say, goal optimization task was uh, resolved by defining this HQ, which is the ratio of these two numbers. And so we try to make the denominator small 
so that things look clustered and we try to make the numerator large so that the centroids look to be far apart apart and so in order to do this calculation we we observe that this hq is is uh, homogeneous in the sense that if you multiply your q by any scaling you get the same function and so therefore i can do scaling of q as i wish and i choose to do the scaling in such a way that q transpose sw q equals one and so doing so my hq is only the numerator q transpose sbq and so therefore my lda problem is reduced into a, a constraint optimization problem I'm trying to maximize Q transpose SBQ, which is the spread of the, the centroids, keeping the, the, the uh, denominator equal to one. And so, so first of all, um, I recall this theorem saying that if, if a matrix is symmetric positive definite, it admits a Cholesky factorization. And so here I'm assuming for the time being that my SW is positive definite, symmetric positive definite. Symmetry is obvious by definition. Positive definiteness may not be, but, but we'll, we'll take care of that later if that's not the case. And so, so now if that's the case, then, then I can write my SW as K transpose K, where K is upper triangular matrix. And there is an effective algorithm to calculate this if, if N is not absurdly large. It may be large, but not, not really like crazily large here. So, so you can calculate the Cholesky factorization. And doing so, we see that the, <clears throat> the constraint is simply saying that KQ vector has unit length. And so why don't we call this KQW? So W is now my new vector. It is a unit length vector. And so in, in terms of W, I can say that the maximization that I'm trying to do, which is the, the, the uh, spread of the centroids of my clusters, is that I maximize the quantity W transpose K transpose inverse, so K transpose inverse is the same as K inverse transpose if you if you wish. So this minus T means that you take inverse and you take transpose in whichever order you prefer, because that is a commuting uh, operation. And then then SP and K inverse W must be maximized subject to that my vector W is having unit length. And so then we do as in constraint optimization often is done, we introduce a Lagrange multiplier, we have just one scalar con condition, namely that W has unit length, and so I'm taking the objective function, which is a quadratic function, minus my Lagrange multiplier times the condition, which has to be zero. W, length of W squared minus one has to be zero. And so then we're looking for the critical points of this, 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 this functional, so that means that I'm taking the gradient with respect to W, and so now we need to know that if you have a symmetric bilinear form like we have here, so then the, the, the gradient is simply the matrix times W, where matrix is now this K minus transpose is B, K minus uh, <coughs> K, K inverse. And so and the, uh, the, the gradient of, of uh, gradient of, uh, sorry, norm of W squared is, is just twice W. So, so I have a very simple formula for the, for the for the gradient, and I'm saying this gradient has to be zero to find the critical points, which leads me to a linear equation. So we see that the Lagrange multiplier approach uh, uh, leads to to an eigenvalue problem. So now we see that we we need to find an eigenvalue lambda and an eigenvector w. So this is a straightforward problem. Uh, However, we need to figure out what eigenvalue we are interested in. And first of all, we want to know also if this, this problem has real eigenvalue. So remember this lambda, my, my Lagrange multiplier was assumed to be real. So if, if I say that this problem has a solution that I wish, then, then of course this lambda has to be real. Now, um, um, so in order to, to, first of all, to understand which eigenvalue we should be looking for, so suppose we have the eigenvalues. So which eigenvalue are we interested in? Because if you have an n by n matrix, so you have at least the, the, the fundamental theorem of, of algebra tells you that there are n 
possibly complex eigenvalue. So, so let's try to figure out which eigenvalue are we interested in. So if I take the, the objective function and I plug in my W, assuming that W is an eigenvector. So assume that W is an eigenvector. So then, of course, this matrix times W is just lambda W, and you see that the objective function is equal to lambda. Okay, so, so if you want to maximize this quantity, so then obviously you have to chase, take your lambda as large as possible. So what does it mean? It means that if you say that lambda is an eigenvalue, you have to take the largest eigenvalue. Okay, so that's that's coming from the from the from the objective that we have. So so first of all, we want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and among those eigenvectors and eigenvalues, we need to choose those that correspond to the largest eigenvalue. So then we are maximizing the right object. Now, look at this matrix K minus transpose SBK inverse. So first of all, you see immediately that this is a symmetric matrix because SB is symmetric. So if you take a transpose, you get the same matrix. And it's not hard to see that since SB is symmetric positive definite, semi-definite, it's not positive definite, but positive semi-definite, we see that this matrix that we are looking at is also symmetric positive semi-definite. So, so if you multiply with, with V from both sides, your matrix, you get a number which cannot be negative. This is good news because we have this eigenvalue theorem, which is one of the basic theorems in, in linear algebra, saying that if you have a matrix which is symmetric, real symmetric matrix, then it has Non, it has it has n real eigenvalues, so that's that's one thing. If your matrix, furthermore, is positive semi-definite, you know that these eigenvalues are all all uh, non-negative. So I should have here that is larger than zero. I I have forgotten to to write that. But so the eigenvalues lambda one, lambda two, etc. They are non-negative. So what we are interested is interested in is this largest eigenvalue. Uh, we also know a little bit more. We know that these eigenvectors can be chosen so that they, they form an orthonormal basis. And so that means that your matrix A has an eigenvalue decomposition. So you are, your matrix can be decomposed as a product of U, lambda, and U transpose, where U contains the eigenvectors in the columns, and lambda contains the eigenvalues in the diagonal. Okay, so this is this is a fundamental theorem which I'm not proving. I'm just using the fact that I know that eigenvalues exist. They are real, and they are they are non-negative. So I have to pick the largest eigenvalue. Now, um, before I go into into the uh, you know the algorithm and um, and the examples, I have to come back for a while and say, well, we assumed in all our calculation that this SW is positive definite, but it could be that it's not positive definite, it may, may be only positive semi-definite. And when is that ca the case? When when your data is, is degenerate. So when you take your data, you centralize each cluster and you, you move your data around the origin. So if your data all lies in a uh, subspace which, lowered, which has lower dimension than your data space, then your S is not going to be positive definite, it's going to be only positive semi-definite. So this is possible. And so therefore we need to make a fix so that we can use the same algorithm even in the case when your S is only positive semi-definite. And so what we are doing is a very standard regularization trick. So we take this SW and we add a tiny little multiple of identity to my, my matrix SW. And so then I get a new approximate matrix. This is not exactly what we had, but it's almost the same as we had. And so then, then I'm, I'm saying that, well, this new matrix here is, is positive definite. And why is that? And here is a typo, the, the second uh, W should be V. I'm sorry about that. It escaped me. I, I tried to guess all the, catch all the typos, but here is one. So V transpose SVW, v, SW epsilon V, so this would be V, would be by definition V transpose SWV plus epsilon times the norm of, of V squared. And so you see that um, that this quantity here is definitely positive because the first term is non-negative and the second term is, is, is positive for, for a V which is non-zero. So 
it means that the, the, the existence of Cholesky factorization for this regularized matrix is warranted. That is a positive definite matrix. So therefore, here is my 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 algorithm now. So so in all its glory, the, the LDA algorithm looks as simple as this. So suppose you are given the data, the annotated data X and I, I is the annotation vector. So you compute the within cluster and between cluster spread matrices S, W, and S, B. So remember, you, you subtract the means and then you move the clusters around the origin. And then you calculate this X, W transpose X, 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 W as S, B similarly. Now, if S, W is positive definite, you don't have to do this following step. If it's not, you regularize, you're adding a small multiple of identity matrix to your SW. Then you calculate the Cholesky factor, and then you form a matrix K minus transpose SBK, and this is also a matrix that, that whose existence is warranted because the diagonal entries of K are all positive, so the inverse of K exists, so, so there is no problem. And there's, there's a typo, unfortunately, also here, so this should be S minus transpose SBK inverse, not transpose, so, so sorry about that. I, I will fix those, those typos before I, I will re-upload my, my slides so that you get the correct version. I apologize for that. And so you find, let's say, the K first eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix, and then you set your projection directions to be this, these Q, QJs, which are K inverse of W. And that's it. So, so this is how you you find these 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 optimal directions where you are when you are projecting your your data. And so that procedure should show if there is cluster uh, structure in your data. So um, before we go into examples, so let's look at some computational considerations. So first of all, um, <clears throat> notice that these W J's they are mutually orthogonal because they are eigenvalue eigenvectors of an, a symmetric positive definite matrix. So we know that they can be chosen to be mutually orthogonal. However, this LDA directions Q, which I obtain by multiplying with K inverse, this W, they are not necessarily, and usually they are not orthogonal. And so that means that if you look at the, the, the QJ vectors, there is there's, there may be quite a bit of redundancy. So you find the best possible projection direction where the, where the clusters show, and then you take the second best direction, and, and there is quite a bit of overlap in, in, in the attributes. So, so the vectors Q1 and Q2 may be, they are not parallel, of course, but they may be very close to each other. So, so there is quite a bit of redundancy in the LDA direction. So they are not like uh, orthogonal directions, although these Ws are. You can orthogonalize them, but, but my experience is that, that orthogonalizing the, the LDA directions is, is not giving, let's say, a visually compelling result usually. And so, so the redundancy is there and we have to live with that. And so how about this uh, epsilon? So, so if you, I said that epsilon should be a small number. Well, small is also always a relative concept because, because small 400 and small for 0 0.01 are two different things. So small should be also relative to the size of the eigenvalues of FW, SW. So what we have usually do, done is that we look at first the, the eigenvalues of SW the largest eigenvalue, so so to speak. And so so you take the largest eigenvalue of SW and then you make your epsilon small relative to the largest eigenvalue. So then you can say that epsilon is small with respect to the size of your matrix SW. And so so this is to guarantee that 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 you know what you're talking about. So so if your matrix S is has huge components, then epsilon equals one could be small. If S on the other hand has small components, epsilon equals one may be huge. And so therefore it's always relative. And so this is the way to make epsilon small relative to the, 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 the matrix SW. Now, uh, the other question is how many ST, uh, LDA directions should we try to find? Well, the thing is, thing is that, that the, the rank, so remember this SB matrix, the SB matrix contained the repeated cluster central, centroids. And so if you have K clusters, those cluster centers are spanning a subspace 
most at most of of dimension k. But since we are subtracting the mean, we are losing one direction, one one dimension, and so so we know that the rank of this 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 matrix k minus transpose S B K inverse is less or equal to k minus one, and so therefore we should, if you ask how many how many uh, um, how many uh, LDA directions you should uh, try to find if you have two clusters, one is enough. If you have three clusters, two is enough. Uh, you you don't get really you don't gain insight if you take more of those uh, LDA directions. So you have to think how many clusters do you have and choose one less at most to be the number of LDA directions that you're looking at. And and so then then you get uh, you know the information out of your data that you wish. Okay, so so these are a couple of of, of numerical uh, considerations that need to be uh, kept in mind. So so let's go and look at some uh, examples so that we understand how this LDA is performing. So first of all, um, uh, I started my my uh, LDA lecture by showing this this uh, uh, simple example where we have. Um, the two cluster data, and I showed that the the PCA direction fails to reveal the cluster clusters in the data. So now I took this data. This is a very simple example because you can, of course, this is a toy example because you can look at the data and you see the cluster structure there already. So so this is just to 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 to, to clarify what we are talking about. So I take this uh, this cluster data and I'm trying to find the direction in which the cluster structure is is shown. Uh, as as well as possible, and you can imagine that the direction should be almost perpendicular to this PCA direction. So let's see what the LDA analysis gives. The LDA direction really gives me this this, this red direction, and so when I project my data into this direction, the histograms look like this. So you see that this direction indeed is doing the job in the sense that in project when projecting the data to to this subspace. Both clusters are as compact as possible, but the separation is lar as large as possible. And so you really see that there is a direction which is uh, in which the the data looks looks separated. So so this is good news. If you if you need to make a classification algorithm, and you you wonder whether your data is such that the clustering algorithm would work, you know you you want to. You want to apply your clustering algorithm in uh, to a non-annotated data, and so you have some training data, which is this that you're looking at, so where you know in which cluster each data vector belongs to. Okay, so now um, before you start implementing your your uh, classification algorithm, you would like to know if there is any hope. For your classification algorithm to have a successful classification, and obviously, if you find an LDA direction in which your clusters look separate, so then there is a good hope to have a good uh, uh, classification algorithm. So this helps you to decide whether there is enough information in your data to separate those clusters. So in this case, I would say yes, and, and obviously, my ex example was such that if if I if I want to separate, I just draw a line between these two clusters in the perpendicular direction of the LDA direction and I have a perfect clustering here. Okay, so this is a this is a trivial example. So let's look at a little bit com more compelling example. I take the handwritten digits that, that I was I was showing. So I have this this uh, um, MNIST data. So we have uh, handwritten digits which are images of 16 by 16. Uh, grayscale picture, pictures, and so I'm I'm organizing the the pixels in a in a long vector. So my vectors are 256, I believe, in length, and uh, I'm looking here at digits 0, 6, and 9. Okay, so these are typically um, handwritten digits that are confused because people write these three letters very similarly. So it is very easy to confuse 0, 6, and 9. In handwritten digits, so I took sort of the the worst case scenario here, and uh, if you uh, 
take a look at the, the PCA uh, projection of that data. So I have these three data sets and I'm plotting the PCA scatter plot now so that my uh, sixes are plotted by, by blue stars, my nines are plotted as red dots and my zeros are plotted at, as uh, green squares. You see that at least I, I would say that zero and six are badly confounded because they are the, the scatter plots are, are badly overlapping. So uh, for, for some reason nines are recognized better and so it is probably pe probably people are writing six and zero in a in a in a way that they look more similar than than what they draw nine and often people are writing the nine with a different pen stroke if you think how you see you write nine so some people at least use a pen stroke where they change the direction of the of the of the pen but when they're, they're when they're drawing six or zero they are just using a round movement and so therefore six and zero are uh, confounded here. So now let's think about it. I have three clusters here. So how many LDA directions should I should I hope to 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 be informative? Well, K minus one, which is in this case is two. So I have three K is three, three clusters. I calculate two LDA directions. And then I plot the components of those projections. And here is how it looks like. This is beautiful. So you see how, how well LDA is separating those three clusters. So so indeed I, I find uh, almost perfect clustering of, of these three handwritten digits. And so this gives me hope that if I'm if I'm uh, working for the post office and, and trying to, to find a, a <clears throat> classification algorithm so that the post will go to the to the correct zip code and or or um, house so then then looks like there is a way to, to to differentiate between these these three handwritten digits so LDA is really telling me that there is enough information in the data to be able to separate between these three digits and so if you if you think what this is saying here so this is the first the the, the x-axis is the first LDA direction so the first LDA direction seems to be able to distinguish between the red one and the rest. Because if you project, if you think that you make histogram of these three uh, clouds now in, in these two directions, you will see that the, the red histogram is nicely separated from the histograms of blue and green. So let's, let's go back. So the red histogram here in the PCA direction seems to be the first one that you are able to separate and you see that this is really the case so the, the red red group which are nines is is kind of outstanding from the rest of it and so so suppose you have so you have subtracted the, the the red dots from from the remaining ones then you take the second lda direction and in the second lda direction which is the which is the the y-axis you see that the green and blue clouds are nicely separated so the histogram would be histograms would have minimum overlap. And so therefore, if I would be, you know, somebody who, who designs um, classification algorithm based on this information, I would first try to classify away the red dots from the rest. And then I would write, try to, to separate between the green and, and, and blue ones. So I would do it in, in, in two, two steps. Now, turns out that if you do this, uh, using let's say the three algorithms then you would see that the three algorithms probably you do exactly like this so they, they would first try to separate between these two groups and then 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 between the green and blue groups we are going to talk about the, the, the three algorithms they are they're kind of very intuitive and nice uh, classification algorithm okay so this is promising so so let's look at uh, another uh, application and this is um, uh, um, facial analysis uh, example. So <clears throat> there is a um, data set which is called Yale Faces, which I think we have reference to that in the in the web page of the of the book. So if you want to go and download those faces, 
uh, you can do that. So what they have, they have 15 individuals. So the, the number of individuals in that database is not large, but but for our purposes, this is this is sort of explaining well what we are trying to do. And so those images are 243 by 320 pixel images with 256 grayscale values. Now, um, 15 individuals, they have, uh, um, I believe, 13 different photographs of each 15 individuals. And the photographs are different from how the lighting comes from. So there is one photograph where the lighting comes from the center, right and left. So there are three. There is uh, one set of um, photographs where everybody is wearing eyeglasses and another set where they are not wearing eyeglasses. And then there are different facial expressions. There is a sad face, happy face, normal face, sleepy face, surprise face, and winking. So, so, so people are basically just um, changing their facial expression, and then the photograph is taken. So each each 15 people have the same set of 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 photographs. And so, for our purposes now, we are looking at uh, let's take two. Uh, sets of those photographs. So I have 15 and 15. So so 15 and 15 uh, photographs which differ by some feature. And my question is, does LDA tell me, does it pinpoint where the where the difference is in, in, in those those uh, uh, photographs? And so I, I took a simple case where I have the face, uh, the photographs of the faces with glasses and without glasses. So, so LDA should be able to tell me if uh, I can tell apart automatically whether a person wears glasses or not. And in particular, I could use this LDA analysis to tell which pixels in that facial expression or in the in that photograph is, is significant in separating whether the people have glasses or not. And you would you would guess, of course, that the important pixels are the pixels around the eyes, right? Because that's where the difference is. So, so somehow this LDA should be able not only to tell me whether I can separate those pictures, but it should also tell me because I can look at the, the, the projection direction that corresponds to the maximum eigenvalue. So the projection direction should be able to tell me where I should look at if I want to separate whether the person has glasses or not. OK, so so um, the the faces, if you if you download the, the faces, you see that they are they are not equally centered. The, the head is moving all over and uh, there's a lot of blank, sp blank space in the picture, etc. So so we did a little bit of, of uh, manual cleaning. So what we did, what we did, we we decided the the pixel size, it is 201 by 141. So why these non-even numbers? I, I uh, guess the idea was that we are looking at the center point in the, in the face where the line of the nose and the line of the eyes meet. OK, so that's the center point of my, 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 my cr uh, cropped pictures. And then I have equal number of pixels above and below and left and right. So that's why these funny numbers came about so so the, the the images are centered at the intersection of eye line and nose line so so the horizontal line is is, is through the centers of the eyes if if possible and the, the vertical line is is following the, the nose so more or less of course the the faces are not, not perfectly aligned and, and people have eyes in different heights etc so there is and not every nose is straight etc so so clearly this is more or less the, the, the description. And so here are the faces. So these are the, the, the 15 faces with glasses. So, so different, different uh, face characteristics and here are without glasses. So you see that the, the expressions are changing a little bit. The position of the head is changing a little bit. But what is most important is that there are glasses or no glasses. OK, so so LDA should be sensitive to the glasses. It will be sensitive to other things, too, because my data set is such a small data set. So what happens is that 
for instance, because the, the, the face is moving a little bit, the um, surrounding is uh, is different. The, the surrounding of the face is different. So so there will be some sensitivity to, um, you know, the position of the head, for instance. OK, so but that's that's what it is. So so. Uh, now I am in a rather uh, different situation from what I had before, namely my data vectors have dimensions 201 by 141, so the, the data space has a dimension of 28,000. Okay, 28,000 and, and, and some. And my uh, data set is rather small. I have only 30 data vectors. So, so now, unlike before, what happens is that my, my data space is, is, is widely larger than, than my, my uh, number of data points. And uh, if you have this, this, this situation, uh, your matrices are going to be badly, badly, badly under uh, the, you know, the scatter matrices are going to be badly um, um, rank deficient. And you have all kinds of problems. And in a very high dimensional space, you, you probably have a lot of lot of possible directions in which you would have a separation. So that, so LDA may may end up picking one single pixel, which is in the background, and that background pixel is then being being used as a separator, which is not what we want. So therefore, what I'm doing, I'm I'm reducing first the dimensionality of the problem. So so what what I do, I I first uh, I I take the PCA. So I take my my X1 and X2, so I have two two clusters here, and so my data X is is consisting of those two two matrices X1 and X2, and so what I'm doing first, I'm calculating the principal components of X1 and X2, so I'm reducing first my data, and in order not to um, bias my 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 process, I'm I'm choosing the new direct the new dimension, the reduced dimensionality of my data to be exactly the, the same as the number of data points. So I have 30 faces, so I have 30 data points, and so I'm reducing first my data to a 30 dimensional space. So now my 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 uh, principal component Z1 and Z2 are the 31st principal components of all the data. And so then I'm applying the LDA algorithm to the to the reduced data. So instead of X, I'm using Z, where Z is, is the matrix composed by Z1 and Z2. And this is this is a rather standard technique. So if you if you are living in a in a high dimensional data space and you have much less data, so it is it is not uncommon that people are first using PCA to reduce the, the problem dimensionality. So for instance, when people are dealing with genetic data, so you have millions of genes. And you have only, let's say, hundreds of samples of the of the bacteria that you're looking at. So, so you would do the same thing there. Um, so, okay. So once you have uh, done the, the the LDA analysis, I'm interested in what was the feature that my LDA was sensitive to, and so I'm taking this Q, which is now in in, in this uh, reduced uh, size data space. And then I'm lifting it back to the to the to the high dimensional data by by saying that these Qs are principal components of some vector Q, which is my separator vector in the high dimensional data space. So I'm doing the analysis in the lower dimensional reduced data space, which is, has dimension 30, and then I'm going back using these uh, principal components Q. And I'm representing my data, my, my, my separating vector in this high dimensional space by, by lifting, by using the, the, the feature vectors. And now Q lives in the space of 2,800,341 dimensional space. So I can reshape my vector and look at it as an image. So each component in this Q vector represents, represents one pixel. And so therefore I can look at the image of the separating direction and that tells me what in those images was LDA sensitive to. And that tells me where the difference between those images were. And so here is here is this, this awful looking picture. So I did the LDA analysis and then I lifted the, um, 
the uh, separating direction into the image space and made it made an image out of that. So notice this is this is kind of a pseudo image because I'm plotting this matrix as a pseudo image. So I have minus one and one. So images, strictly speaking, should be from zero to, to one or, or zero to whatever gray lay gray level uh, um, value you have. But so I'm just plotting here the matrix. And so this is the separating vector as an image. And uh, in face, facial analysis, this, this sort of image is, is referred to as, the, as a Fisher face. So Fisher in honor of Ronald Fisher, who, who came up with this LDA in the, the statistical framework. And so what is striking here is that uh, when you have the high values, either positive or negative, those are the pixels to which my analysis was sensitive to. And so you see that clearly, the the eyewear is something that the the uh, uh, analysis was sensitive to. There are high values also around the head, and that's because the heads were moving, and so there is a difference in uh, um, in the contrast, a strong difference in the contrast around the head. And so, of course, my LDA analysis doesn't know that this this is this is a secondary effect, but. But so, so clearly it is sensitive to what happens around the eyes. And so, so therefore, looking at this picture, you would say, oh yeah, the analysis is based on, on, on what, is, what is happening around the eyes. And so that's, that's the correct interpretation here. And so just out of uh, curiosity, how do the mean values of the faces look like? So, so on the left, you see that the, the average face with the glasses on. And on the right, you have the average face with glasses off. And so they look like this is, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the mean faces are, are kind of, yes, they look like faces, but they are sort of um, not particularly personal looking. So they are sort of an, um, really an average face. But so you see that the, the difference between these two averages is, is mostly around the, the, the eyes because you have the, the glasses or no glasses off. And so, so my LDA analysis picks those pixels and makes the, uh, the separation of the clusters based on them. So <clears throat> we have recently been using this LDA analysis to, to analyze uh, brain data. So we were looking at meditation data. People are um, meditating. So these are professional meditators. And we were trying to see in which brain regions uh, the um, uh, brain activity is, is is changing most while 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 a person is meditating versus when the person is not meditating, and it's it's very nice to see that the idea that you see here in the Fisher face, we had something which we we could call Fisher brain, which is telling which part of the brain seems to be behaving differently during the meditation uh, compared to when the person is not meditating. So. So, so there are real applications with this, which, which <clears throat> is one of the motivations why I'm interested in this, uh, this technique. Okay, so, so this is um, more or less what I have with, with LDA uh, at this point, and we can move to the next topic. I need to stop sharing for a while because I have to change the, the, um, the slides, just a moment. I... OK, so here we go. So I may have told you last week that I'm going to talk about SOM, but then I realized that I was uh, given the program, uh, the outline, uh, by saying that the next uh, topic is non-negative matrix factorization, and that's what I'm going to do next. Just a moment, I need to find my... my slides. Okay. I guess I have them. Um, 
actually, if we want to make a break, so so it would be maybe a good idea to to make a break right now. So it is it is sort of dividing this 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 lecture into pieces. So if we if you have a break until four o'clock, that may be a reasonable solution. Um, so everybody has a little bit of time to to flex the muscles and <laughs> and take a walk and take a coffee or something. Okay. Okay for me. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. Four o'clock. Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Yes.
Okay, I believe it's um, <clears throat> four o'clock, so may, we can we can maybe continue. So I continue sharing my yes. screen. Here we go, and so then. Okay, so so here we go. So the uh, next topic, as I as I mentioned, is um, is non-negative matrix factorization, and <clears throat> we are continuing um, from the topic that that PCA um, started. Namely, approximation of data uh, in uh, lower spatial dimensions. So, so recall what what did PCA do? So you have a data matrix X, which is an n by p matrix, and if you take the singular value decomposition of your X, you get this this decomposition X equals U times D times V transpose, where U and V are orthogonal matrices and D is a diagonal matrix, and so then the PCA approximation is that you choose a number K, which is less than the rank of the, the matrix X. Um, and so then you write your X approximately as UK, DK, VK transpose. And so this is a this is a matrix of rank K. And so UK is a matrix whose columns are the first K left singular vectors. DK is the diagonal matrix of size K by K, where you have the singular values in the diagonal, and V has the, the, the right singular vectors in, in its columns. And so um, this is a good approximation of X, and actually this is the best approximation in some sense of X, namely, um, suppose you uh, look for any other uh, low, low rank approximation. There is some sort of could you thank you so yeah um, some somebody's microphone was open so uh, okay so <clears throat> let's look at uh, I'm writing a slightly different way this uh, approximation so let's denote by HK the matrix matrix product DK VK transpose so this is a K by P matrix and so if I write this uh, approximation of X using singular value decomposition, I write X equal approximately to UK times H, HK. So I have just combined these two last uh, matrices here into one, which is denoted by H. And uh, so these uh, columns of U, we refer to them as feature vectors because every data point can be represented as a linear combination of them. So they are sort of capturing all the features. The salient features in your your uh, data uh, x, and so these edges are um, in the PCA situation. They are called the the, the uh, principal components of x. Now, in general, um, let's look at this this approximation. X is approximately U K H K. So here is a theorem saying that the SVD provides the best possible low rank approximation of X in the following sense. If you have any two vectors W and H, which have dimensions N by K and K by P, so that the inner dimension K has to be the same, so that W times H is, is well-defined matrix product. And so then you're approximating your X by this product W times H. So this theorem says that the singular value decomposition gives the best possible approximation. So the error in the approximation is smallest if you choose your W and H by using singular value decomposition. So singular value decomposition is indeed the best possible low rank approximation of your matrix X. And so here this, this F is the Frobenius norm. So remember what the Frobenius norm of a matrix was. You take uh, the square sum of all entries of your matrix, and that's the Frobenius norm squared. Now, my question that I'm addressing here now is, um, um, is, uh, oops, sorry, um, 
is there a way to interpret the feature vectors in terms of the data attributes? And what do I, what do I mean by this? So remember when we were looking at this Fisher face, for instance, I wanted to interpret the um, uh, separating vector Q as an image. And I could do that kind of, I, I made a pseudo image where I, I neglected the fact that some of the pixel values were negative. So strictly speaking, negative values are meaningless in, in image analysis. And so if I would uh, have to apply some sort of image processing algorithm to my, my Fisher face, I would have a little bit of a problem by reinterpreting the negative values, negative pixel values. So, so what do they mean really? Should I take the absolute value of the image? Should I just shift the image up or down so that all the, all the pixel values are positive or what should I do? So there is no direct interpretation of the pixels in terms of, of pixel values. So that's what I mean by, by data attributes. Data attributes in this image case is, is uh, uh, referring to pixel values. Well, if you look at an economic data, so you don't want that the gross national product, for instance, is negative. So if you have a vector, which is a feature vector, which has negative components, you cannot really interpret those vectors in terms of the attributes, because for instance, gross national product should not be negative. And if you have a negative component, then, then you lose the interpretation of your, of your, of your feature vector. So in particular, if the data is, is non-negative, you would like to have your feature vector components to be negative, non-negative too. And this is the goal in this, this, uh, this uh, case. So for instance, in handwritten digits, X, XJ represents a black and white image, and XJK is the grayscale value of the kth pixel, and that should be between zero and one. Now, if you take the SVD, your feature vectors are almost certainly not in the, in the interval zero or one. Why? Because they are orthogonal vectors. And if you take orthogonal vectors, uh, typically you have negative and positive components which are cancelling. See, the only way you can have, uh, you know, non-negative unit vectors which are orthogonal is that the, the, their supports are different. But that's not what it, that's not what SVD gives you. As SVD gives typically vectors which have negative and positive entries so that the, the, the inner products could be zero. So we would like to have a way to interpret those feature vectors and, and uh, and uh, assure that the components are non-negative. So I'm going to use the following notation. A matrix A is in R, M, N plus. This notation means that all the components of my matrix A are non-negative. Okay, so this is, this is simply a notation. So the NMF problem, non-negative matrix factorization problem is the following. If you are given a matrix X with non-negative entries, <clears throat> so your data is, is is non-negative. The problem is to find two matrices W and H, which both are non-negative, in such a way that W times H is approximating the data in the in the Frobenius norm as well as possible. So we'd like to minimize the error that you make when you approximate your X by this, this product H by W by, by H. Okay, so, so this is a clear clear problem. Single value decomposition won't do because that doesn't guarantee the positivity of the entries, so we need to do something else here. And so in, in the following, I'm going to use the following uh, convention. So when I have a matrix and I'm referring to the columns, I'm using the uppercase in parentheses index to, to index the vectors that, that uh, constitute the uh, columns. When I'm referring to the rows of the matrix, I'm using the lowercase index in parentheses. So my X lowercase vectors are row vectors now. Now, uh, Frobenius norm can be written in terms of both the column vectors and row vectors. So if you, if you take the row vector picture, or let's say column vector picture first. So if you take the L2 norm squared of each column, that's just a square sum of, of the entries in that column. And then you take a sum of those square sums, you get, of course, the square sum of all entries in X. And so that has to be the Frobenius norm squared. The same way, if you take the, uh, the uh, row vectors and you transpose them so that you get column vectors, so now you are in RP. And you can calculate the, the, um, 
the L2 norm or the Euclidean norm of each of those column vectors. And then again, you take the sum and you get the Frobenius norm. So, so we can express the Frobenius norm in terms of the columns or in terms of the rows. So this this transpose here is not, of course, necessary if you if you define the the uh, L2 norm or the Euclidean norm for row vectors too. Uh, but since I have defined the, the Euclidean norm for column vectors only, I take the transpose first and so that I make the rows as columns, and then I calculate the uh, the the Euclidean norm. So this is just a small detail, but but let's let's be systematic here. So. So fine, so so let's see. Let's look at the product W times H and I'm writing my H now column by column. So W times H is W times column one, column two, etc., column P of my matrix H. And so then I can apply this matrix product to each column separately. So my WH is actually a matrix whose columns are WH1, etc., WHP. And so therefore, if I'm looking at the um, uh, error of the approximation of X by the product a W times H, I'm using the column vector uh, uh, view of the Frobenius norm, and I'm saying that this is simply the sum of the L2 norms of these columns of this error matrix, X minus WH. So this is the column-wise way of saying what I'm trying to minimize. We can also take the row wise view. And so first of all, I'm using the fact that the, the Frobenius norm of a matrix equals the Frobenius norm of the transpose of that matrix. So I'm taking first the transpose of my X minus WH. Now, transpose of WH using the fact that the transpose of a product is a product of the transposes, but in the reverse order, I get that this transpose is H transpose W transpose. And so then <clears throat> if I now uh, write my W transpose in the way that I'm listing the, the columns of that matrix, well, the columns of the, the W transpose are the transposes of the rows. So if W1 to Wn are the rows of my W, then, then W transpose contains columns, which are the transposes of those rows. <clears throat> and so then if I take the... Uh, the product H, H transpose W, I'm just multiplying each one of those columns by H transpose. And so in this case, my, my Frobenius norm that I'm trying to minimize is simply the sum of the uh, column, the row of X minus H transpose W uh, row, everything written in column vector. So, so this is another way of writing this, this, this Frobenius norm. And so, um, if you look at these two expressions, you, what, you, what you find is that if in the first case, if W were known, somehow what you would, you would uh, so X is of course known, so data is, is data, so it's given, <clears throat> as the name says, so X is known. So if you know W, if you want to minimize this expression, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find the least square solution, HJ, to the equation WHJ equals XJ. So you are trying to minimize the in the in the least square sense the difference with the constraint that the co coefficients of H up are non-negative, because that's important for us. And the same way if you're looking at the row-wise picture of the of the uh, problem, so then you realize that if X is given and H is given, then W's can be resolved in the least square sense row by row with the restriction that W's, the components of W, they have to be non-negative. So, so we are basically, we are, we are splitting this problem into um, separate least squares problems, which, which, have, which are done column by column and row by row. But the assumption was that here W was known and here H was known. So it's not rocket science to think that maybe we could do an alternating Algorithm. So we start with some initial guess of W. We find an update for H, which is which is satisfying this least squares problem with positivity constraint. That gives an update of H, and then we are updating W by by solving the second set of equations in the least squares sense. And 
this is indeed the, what, what the so-called ANLS algorithm is doing, alternating non-negative least squares algorithm is doing, and I'm describing it soon. But before we do that, let me point out a, a, a pitfall here, and it is related to the non-uniqueness. So, so if, you, if you look at this WH product, and then you take a diagonal matrix L, and you multiply L, L inverse, so these, these lambdas are, are positive numbers, you, you put L inverse L in between W and H, you see that you get another matrix matrix decomposition, which are all non-negative too. Uh, if you define WH to be uh, W times L inverse. So let's look at what that uh, means. So if I take W L inverse, if I multiply a matrix with a diagonal matrix from the right, it means that I'm scaling the columns of my matrix. So, so the first column of W is scaled by lambda 1, the, the last one is by lambda K, so I'm scaling each column like that. Now, um, if you don't take into, into account this, this uh, non-uniqueness, so if you are just applying the, the, the alternating iteration, what happens to you almost certainly is that one of the matrices, let's say W, is going to zero, and age is going to infinity. So, so typically, if you don't care about the scaling issue, you you get nonsense out of your algorithm. So, so the the, the product is is you're walking along, a, 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 let's say, a, a subspace if you want, or or a, 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 <clears throat> You know, uh, a subset in the in the solution space, uh, which extends to infinity. And so, typically, when you do this iteration, your your iteration points escape to infinity. And so, one of the matrices typically goes to zero, and the other one goes to infinity, and you get nonsense out. So, 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 what typically is done is that that between each iteration, you are scaling back your your uh, W so that the scaling keeps your solution in the in the feasible space. And so the typical uh, customary choice for the scaling is that you you scale your um, feature vectors so that they have always the L infinity norm, which is the maximum of the components equal to one. So this makes sense, for instance, in image applications. So so the feature vectors you want them to be images. So if you decide that your grayscale values are between zero and one, so therefore the feature vectors, in order to be images. The value should also be between zero and one. So if you scale the maximum to be between uh, zero and one, so then, then 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 clearly you have images as feature vectors. Well, sometimes you want to scale uh, the ages. So depending on the application. So for 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 the uh, sake of definiteness, I'm assuming that I'm I'm using the the column scaling of my W. And so if I do so, here is the NANLS algorithm, alternating non-negative least squares algorithm. So uh, you set W to be W0, so you can do this, like draw your W from, from random number generator. So you, you, you fill your W first with, uh, let's say, numbers between 0 and 1 drawn randomly. That's a typical initialization. And then you continue this, uh, this uh, uh, iteration until the stopping criterion is satisfied, and I'm going to talk about the stopping criterion soon. So, so first you update your age by solving a least quest problem, uh, minimizing this error Frobenius norm using the least quest formulation subject to positivity constraint for for ages. Once you have an age, you go and you update your W using the freshly updated age, and you get, again, an update of W. You have updated H and W, then you go and scale the columns of your W, so that the, 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 the column L infinity norm of W is equal to 1. So what you do, you calculate the maximum value of your W's column by column, and then you are scaling the columns by the maximum. So now, every time you, you restart your W, is a matrix whose uh, columns have the maximum value equal to one. 
and you continue until you see some sort of convergence. So, so what does this convergence mean? So you advance the counter and then you then you check for convergence, restart. <coughs> so here are some computational details. So first of all, as I said, the entries of, of W0 are typically drawn in application from uniform distribution over the interval 0, 1. You can also scale before you start so that your initial W is already scaled between 0 and 1. So that's that's something that you, you, you might want to do. Now, this um, least squares problem solve for H columns uh, so that you are solving the least squares problem written here in step 2 subject to positivity is actually a constant quadratic optimization problem. So you're, you're minimizing a quadratic function subject to uh, inequality constraint. And without going into details how this optimization problem is, is solved, I'm just saying that MATLAB provides a rather robust tool. So there is a there is a command which is called LSQ, uh, LSQ non-neg. And I believe Python has the same same command actually. And so 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 if you and what you give as an input is the matrix W and the right hand side. So so here the right hand side is the jth column of, of X. And so then this LSQ non returns a column which is going to be the, the jth column of your updated age. And so so you can you can pretty easily construct uh, the, uh, the algorithm. This is maybe not the fastest possible way to do things, but and I'm going to give you an alternative algorithm which is faster, but this is this is certainly the most straightforward idea that you can think of. Now the the B step where you are updating your W, so you have again the same type, type of, of minimization, quadratic minimization problem. So what you do, you go, you use this LSQ non-neg command, and you use as input your your current H prime. H is the the um, the matrix H and prime takes the transpose, and then you take as an as the right hand side, you take the jth row of X, and then you take the transpose. So it's a column. And so then what this gives you is a, is a vector VT, which is the which is the, the jth row of your W matrix, and then you write your W. So so this is this is pretty easy to use and, and implement. And the C step in the in the algorithm is once you have your W, you calculate the uh, L infinity norm of each column, W1, etc. WK, and then you scale your column so that the L infinity norm of each scale, each scale column is equal to one. You continue this until you, you see convergence. And so what do we mean by convergence? Well, um, one idea that immediately comes in, in, in your mind, but then a little bit of reflection shows that this is not a good idea. So the tempting idea is that you continue this iteration until the, the approximation is good enough. So you give some tolerance and you say, I want to approximate my X within this tolerance by this, this matrix vector, matrix, matrix, matrix product. What is the problem? You don't really know how small this error theoretically can be. I mean, if I if I take a matrix X and I take the, the, the first singular value, I can of course calculate how large the error is, but I cannot guarantee that the error is smaller than what I want. So it may be that this error, even in the in the optimal case, that is the SVD case, is larger than let's say 100. But I don't know what this 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 uh, optimal case is. So there's no way for me to know how small this error can theoretically speaking be. And so therefore I cannot use this because that 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 leads to either a loop which is not stopping ever, or it may stop immediately depending on what you put for tau, and you don't know how well you are doing. So. So a better idea is that you are iterating until you don't see much changes in your on your updates. So this is this is uh, um, the idea here. So so W T plus one minus W T is the the change in the Frobenius norm during the last iteration, and the relative change is obtained by dividing by, by the Frobenius norm of W T of the previous change. So this tells you the the, the the fraction of change in, in, in terms of Frobenius norm in W, and likewise you have the, the uh, relative change in your age in terms of, of, of Frobenius norm, and you say, well, let's 
continue until my W's and H's change less than, let's say, 1%. So I have usually used 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 as, as a tolerance here. And, and usually a uh, couple of hundreds of iterations enough, so you reach this, this level. So, so that makes the, the algorithm not, not too heavy and not too slow. However, you can, you can sort of follow the, the, the relative change. It, it, usually it goes first down, then it goes for a while up, and then it starts de decreasing again. And, uh, and so that's the typical, typical behavior of this. Um, so there is, at least I don't have any guarantee that, that, that there is um, a good convergence, but so this is sort of an empirical rule really. So, um, so uh, before I go and show your examples about the, the non-negative matrix factorization, I'm, I'm giving you another alternative formulation which leads to a faster converging algorithm. And this is really the NMF algorithm that people are normally using when they're talking about NMF. So if you go and, and look in the literature, what NMF they are using this, what I'm calling multiplicative updating is the one that, that, that people normally use. And so this multiplicative updating is the, um, um, there was a, there was this uh, article in Nature in 1999, I believe, where um, two researchers from uh, Leung and Sang, or Song from um, Bell Labs, they, um, Sort of reintroduce the, the non-negative matrix factorization. Non-negative matrix factorization historically is an older invention. So there is uh, there are two uh, Finnish researchers, Penti Pater and, and uh, Tapper, I forget his first name, who suggested this this algorithm in in the early uh, 80s already, I believe, and they used it for uh, I believe in chemo metrics and, and radiation. Uh, spectroscopy and then these two guys from from uh, bell lab they they refound this algorithm and they made it really popular because they connected it into into data science so they they, they realized that this is something that can be used in image processing and data text mining so 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 there is a little bit of history here so so in that algorithm that famous algorithm that that made the the non-negative matrix factorization sort of known in that nature paper, um, this multiplicative updating algorithm was suggested, or at least they suggested to use that. I'm not sure if this was really their own original idea, but but this is what people usually use. Okay, that's a little bit from history. So so I'm going to look at this um, uh, NMF problem with the with the uh, enhanced constraint that W and H must be not only non-negative but but strictly positive. Okay, so strictly positive. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, I'm deriving some sort of fixed point um, formula for for doing the updating. So there is a very simple multiplicative updating formula, which can be understood by uh, by looking at the reparameterization of the matrices. So, so if my W's need to be positive and H H's need to be positive, so I can write them by Wij is exponential of Xij, where this Xij is obviously the logarithm of, of Wij. And since his Ws are positive, so, so this is well defined. And so then I'm minimizing this f functional here with respect to xi and zeta. Okay, so I'm, I'm just plugging in these, these representations into my, my, my expression here. And then I'm minimizing with respect to these new, new parameters. And so therefore I need to calculate the gradient of F. And this is a little bit complicated looking uh, calcul calculation, but it is pretty straightforward. So I'm going sort of cursorically through this. So, so if you want to calculate the derivative of the Frobenius norm with respect to, to C, what it amounts to is that you, since this is a quadratic uh, uh, formula, so you have Xij minus Wh Maybe I should have a yeah. So there's one half here. So no, this this one half is is <clears throat> is cancelling. So I get uh, the difference times the partial derivative of the product of the ij component of w. 
Now, when I'm differentiating with respect to Xi, <clears throat> remember my W dependent of, of, of Xi and H did not. So the only thing that I have to differentiate is W. So, so when I calculate the, the, the derivative of this matrix matrix product, I write it first component-wise as a matrix matrix product, and then I'm differentiating out in the, only the part which depends on Xi. Now, if, uh, <clears throat> so remember this, this transformation from W to Xi was, was diagonal in the sense that IJ component depends only on IJ component. So the derivative of W with respect to Xi is very simple. Namely, we know that if mu equals I and nu equals L, so I and mu are equal and L and nu are equal, so then my W, I, L is simply exponential of Xi mu nu. Okay, so, so that's fine. The derivative of the exponential function is itself. Well, this exponential function by definition is the same as, as, as W mu nu. And now mu and nu are i and l, so I see that this diff derivative here is directly the same as w i l. While if i is not mu or l is not nu, the derivative is zero, because my xis were supposed to be independent. So so only the the component that has the same indices depends on on this xi, and others do not. And so therefore I get that the, the uh, <clears throat> uh, derivative of this product, let's go here. So, so I'm, I'm plugging in here the, the derivative. So, so the derivative is, is W I L if mu equals I. So I use the Kronecker symbol, which is one if and only if mu equals I and nu equals L. So there's another Kronecker symbol, which is one if and only if nu equals L. And the summation is over the L index. Now, if I'm summing over L index, the only time that I get non-zero is when this L equals new. And so of all these, these entries, only the one where L equals new survives. And this summation over L becomes a, 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 a triviality. And I really get simply the component W I new uh, H new J. And then I have this, this, this extra Kronecker delta symbol here, which is guaranteeing that this is zero if and only if, uh, is non-zero if and only if mu equals i. So then I'm plugging this expression into my derivative of f. And so therefore my derivative of f with respect to c is simply xij minus the ij components of wh. And then I have the derivative that I just calculated. Now I see that there are two uh, sums. There is summation over i and summation over j, but I have this Kronecker delta here. So this i summation gives me zero unless mu equals i. And so the only term that is surviving from the i summation is i equals mu. And so therefore I'm just plugging in i equals mu in this expression and I have a single summation j. Now, this is nice because now I don't have any Kronecker deltas here, and these are simply matrix matrix products. So let's look at the, the first term. So here I have x mu j, and then I have h nu j, and summation over nu. So that is actually nothing else but the mu nu component of x h transpose. And that is multiplied by w mu nu. And when you're looking at the second component, so, so there again I have a matrix matrix product of, of WH and H transpose. And so, so this is my, my um, derivative of the objective function. And if I want to find a uh, uh, critical point, I, I set this equal to zero. Now, when you write this, you see that, OK, so I could actually subtract, I, I could cancel this W mu nu here because it's a positive number. Well, if you do that, you are back to the to the uh, least squares problem. So you don't want to do that. So, OK, so so you can you can cancel this this W and that's perfectly correct. But then you then you see that what you're trying to find is is just the least squares problem solution. So what I'm doing, I'm doing something slightly different. I'm, I'm solving this equation for one of these w mu nu's and keeping the w mu nu on the other side. So this gives me an updating formula. So if my mu nu is 
the current value of W mu nu, this formula gives me an updating formula for the next round for W mu nu. So you can think that I'm sort of looking at this as a, as a fixed point problem where you use the old value to update the new value. So, uh, so, so this, this is the logic here. So I, I use this, this parameterization in order to get this, this updating formula. Well, this is assuming that H is known. But it is not known, of course. So, so what we do, we do the the calculation, the similar calculation by differentiating with respect to zeta, which was the parameter of h. And I'm not going too much into detail because you know already how I do that. So I'm differentiating h using the same Kronecker uh, delta symbol to to get rid of this L summation. And one of these. Uh, deltas are killing the uh, the J summation in the in the definition D F D mu nu, and I end up with the with the with the critical point value critical point condition that this uh, um, component uh, should be zero. And again, I don't want to subtract or cancel H mu nu because that gives me again the the least quest problem. But I'm using this formula to, to, to do updating for H mu nu. So now I have two updating formulas. It's w updating if H is known. Well, there is also the old value of W. And uh, uh, the updating of H if W is known, and of course, the old value of, of, of W. So, so here I have collected uh, the two formulas together. So now I have two updating formulas, and we start with an initial guess. So again, we do a, a um, initialization of W and H. Actually, we do only the, the initialization of, of uh, yeah, I believe I have to do both of them. OK, so I'm initializing W and H. And, um, and so then we are using sort of a fixed point iteration. We are updating H and W alternatingly until we have the convergence, and the convergence is defined in the same way as in the ANLS algorithm. And so here is the, the multiplicative updating algorithm in all its glory. So we set the counter equal to zero, and we initialize W and H zero using, for instance, random initialization. And so then we calculate the current approximation xc, xc for current. And so this is what, what your approximation would be if you use the, the current values of w and h. And then let's go back to the, the formula. So here I have, I have a wh, you see, in the denominator. So that's the current value of my approximation. And I have wh in the, in the lower formula, and that's my current value for x. Uh, approximation. So, <clears throat> so what I'm doing, I'm using the the updating formula for H, using the previous values of W, and the current approximation for for uh, the the X as as um, multipliers, and I'm updating my H by multiplying component by component the old values by this new new ratio. So notice this, this new ratio is, is one when if you would have an exact formula x equals wh, so your x would be equal to xc. So then this ratio would be one and you would have um, identity, ht plus one is ht, but usually you don't. And uh, so the same way when you have updated your h, you can, you can recalculate the current approximation of x and then you do the updating of W using the current approximation of X by multiplying the current value by this, this ratio. And you do this, and then you do the, the column scaling again, because this algorithm, likewise as the, the ANLS algorithm, is, is uh, uh, having a non-unique, uh, let's say, fixed point, if you like, and, and so your your solution may skip in, uh, may escape into infinity. So typically your W goes to zero and your H goes to, to, to infinity or vice versa. So you want to do a scaling every time you have done the updating. And so I'm using the same scaling. I'm, I'm scaling the columns of W to be 
uh, L infinity equal to one norms, uh, vectors. And so then you advance the counter and you do it again and check the convergence. So the convergence condition is that we use the same convergence condition. I, I didn't say it here. The same convergence condition as you use in ANLS. And so here is how this algorithm is often written. Uh, so let's introduce this uh, circled multiplication and circled division of matrices. So if B and C are matrices of the same size, then B uh, circle product C is, is just a pointwise product of the matrices. And the circle division of the matrices is that you divide pointwise. And there should be, yeah, okay, so yeah, right. You, you divide the ijth component of B by the ijth component of C. Now, if you look what your algorithm looks like, uh, <clears throat> this looks like some sort of APL code or something. But so, so what you do is you, you, mark, you calculate the matrix vector product uh, WTX, matrix vector product WTX uh, current, where X current is W current time H current. And then you use the uh, multiplical, multiplicative division to calculate the ratio of these two matrices element by element, and then you're updating H element by element by that factor. <clears throat> and likewise, your W is, is calculated as a scaling of, of, of W by the ratio. And so this XC, it may be recalculated when you do the updating from H to W. If you don't recalculate, if you use you, you recalculate this XC only after both H and W are updated. It's basically the same uh, effect. It doesn't, doesn't change much the algorithm if you recalculate the current approximation. So for completeness, I did here a recalculation of XC. But if you, if you skip this, this part C, um, you don't probably see much difference in, in, the, in the performance of the algorithm. There may be one or two iterations more, but that's that's so minimal that that you may want to simplify your algorithm. Now, um, so this is the this is the algorithm that people are usually referring to when they are talking about non-negative matrix factorization. There is another alternative formulation, and I'm I'm simply telling you I'm not going through it because it's the the, the derivation is basically the same. So there's an alternative cost function. So instead of looking at the Frobenius norm, you can use some sort of entropy divergence of the matrices. And so entropy divergence looks pretty much like kullback leibler uh, distance of, uh, of, uh, of kullback leibler divergence of matrices. Uh, there is this uh, difference of A, I, J, and B, I, J, which is, which is added there. And so basically you do the same thing, you are just minimizing uh, the um, the difference between your data and the WH matrix in, in with respect to this uh, entropy divergence. But so as I said, there is there's not much that you 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 gain by going through this. I'm skipping. They are included in my slides. So if you want to go and look at the details, um, as you can see, it leads to a slightly different updating formula. Um, but the standard uh, updating is, is, is based on the Frobenius norm. And so that's, that's the algorithm that you probably may want to implement. It's very simple to implement, as you could see. OK, so, so in order to, to give you some sense of what you can do with this non-negative matrix factorization, we have 15 minutes time, so we, have, we are good in, in schedule. So uh, let's look at these, these handwritten uh, digits. So that, that's sort of the standard data set in, in many data science applications. People are usually testing their algorithms with that, that data set. And so to remind you, the, the images are, so we have 1707 in the, in the data set that I use here. There are much more in the in, in, uh, in internet. So if you want, you can use, you can download huge data sets. I'm using this uh, this the data set here, so I have seven, 1,700 uh, handwritten digits 
which are classified and they are grayscale images. So the values are between zero and one. And so there are two tests that I'm going to do. So I'm, I'm going to see what happens if I'm um, uh, approximating my X with, with WH where the rank is equal to K is 49. So why 49? I took 49 because it's seven by seven and I can show a seven by seven panel easily on my, my screen. So you could use a larger K if you if you want. But I, I took this so that I have sort of a, enough of those uh, uh, feature vectors, but not too much. OK, so so this 49 is, is rather arbitrary number here. <clears throat> so. So the feature vectors are so the fragments of the handwritten digits. So remember, the feature vectors are uh, images which have values between zero and one. And so I'm composing my images XJ of fragments. And so all the numbers here are positive, so, so there's nothing that cancels. So I cannot take, let's say, a zero and then another almost similar zero and hope that uh, some of the pixels cancel each other because there's no cancellation, everything is positive. So, so this, is, this is cumulative sum. So when I'm adding a term, it is just adding cumulatively positive values to the pixels. So if I believe that my X data set, which, which contains all these, these uh, uh, handwritten numbers, are well represented by the feature vectors. So then these feature vectors must be small fragments of the handwritten images, handwritten digits. And these, these eights are telling how I'm composing, like a mosaic, the handwritten digits from the, from the, from the small pieces. And so let's see how they look like. So here are the seven by seven, the 49 feature vectors. And so you see indeed that there are fragments of different numbers here. So there's one which looks like like one. So if you if you have ones in your data set, so so they probably were going to use use this uh, this uh, uh, fragment in 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 order to make the mosaic. There are some which look like like parts of zero, so sixes. There are parts that look like part, there are uh, fragments that look like parts of fives and twos. So you can imagine that that using these these uh, details, you can compose neatly your uh, handwritten digits. And so to show that this is indeed the case, I have taken here six arbitrary, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, three arbitrary uh, digits. So one, six and eight. So these are the data. And then I'm asking how well I'm approximating these three sample cases using these fragments. And so on the right, you will see the approximation. So 49 feature vectors approximate my one given here by what you see on the on the right, the six and eight. So, so the approximations are not bad. They are not perfect. There is just a little bit of, of shadows of other uh, digits there, but so, and in the middle, what do I have here? So this is a seven by seven panel, which is giving the coefficients. So white means zero and black means one. And so let's look at this one here. So the coefficients here, the seven by seven coefficients are organized so that they correspond to this map here. So this one, for instance, uses uh, mostly uh, the components, let's see, let's go to uh, in the row column sense, I would say two, five. Two, five is a large number here. So let's go here and two, five. Two, five is, it's, um, it's, it's this fragment here. Maybe, I'm not sure if I have the fragments correctly. I would expect that this this fragment here is uh, is more prominent. I have to check my my plotting, but so so you get the idea. So so uh, what these coefficients are telling me uh, is which fragments are making up the approximation of my my letter. And so you see that, for instance, I can be approximated by rather sparse basis because the one is is approximated by by a. Uh, sparse basis. So the most of the coefficients are essentially zero. They are not exactly zero because remember my edges are positive 
but they're close to zero, so that in this plot they, they appear as white. Whereas eight is, is a more complex uh, digit, and so you need more of these details to, to compose your, your, your eight. So in, in the paper of, um, in, in Nature paper, where, where the, the authors were uh, promoting this non-negative matrix factorization, they used this, this idea of uh, non-negative matrix factorization by saying that it gives you a way to make the whole as part of its, uh, as a sum of its parts. And so they used it for, for, for representing facial um, data. And so, so that means that if you take a lot of faces and you do this non-negative matrix factorization, there may be uh, one uh, feature vector where there's only one eye. There may be another feature vector where there's a part of a mouth and, and so on. And so then you compose the faces <coughs> using those details. And so, so here is sort of the, 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 the same idea represented in uh, in, in terms of these hundred and digits. So um, so in the previous one, I, I used this non-negative matrix factorization to, to decompose my data into feature vectors that are parts of the feature vectors. And so here my K was relatively large, it was 49. Uh, this uh, uh, non-negative matrix factorization can be used differently. So if you have a large data set and you want to have a quick summary of what's in the data set. The non-negative matrix factorization gives you a rather comprehensive idea what's in there. So I'm, I'm using the same algorithm. I'm using only the digit three and seven. So suppose I have this data set where I have threes, hundred and threes and hundred and sevens. And I would like to know, first of all, what's in my data set and how many, whatever there is, I have of these different, what are the proportions of these different uh, uh, elements that my data co comprises? So, so in this case, how many threes and how many sevens I would have? Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm doing the NMF with, with a small k, I'm choosing k equals to six. Well, in this case, it is clear that my, my feature vectors will not be able to uh, approximate well the, the single data vectors because I have so few feature vectors. So what NMF does in this case is that it finds an average approximation, so to speak, of, of what's in your data. And when you look at this average approximation, you get a good idea what your data comprises. So here is, here is the, the, uh, the case. Um, I had um, a little bit more than 100 of threes in my data set and almost 200 sevens. And uh, so when I took the, the data set, I, I discarded every other hundred and digit but threes and sevens. And so about one third of my data was representing hundred and three, threes and two thirds were representing hundred and sevens. And then I took the, the non-negative matrix factorization and here are the six feature vectors. And as you can see, the feature vectors tell me what my data in the average looks like. It tells me that there are something that looks like threes and there's something that looks like sevens, but not only that, it also tells me the ratios in which these, these, these uh, 100 digits appear. So two of the, the feature vectors are representing a three and four of them are representing sevens. And so this gives me a quick summary of my data. If I, look, if I see this, I say, well, probably my data comprises threes and sevens, and there are more sevens than threes. In, in the right, you see these red dots and, 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 and black dots. What I have done here is I took the age matrix and I plotted, um, age matrix has six rows, right? So it has, has, has six rows, one row for each feature vector. So I have plotted here by a, by a black dot, the, the coefficients that corresponds to that, that correspond to, to threes. So I have organized my data so that the first hundred and some data points were threes and the remaining data points were sevens. And so I'm asking which coefficients uh, of these uh, feature vectors are representing my data. And as you can see, 
the threes are um, um, having larger coefficients corresponding to the first feature vector and the fourth feature vector. So, so the the first column in in this this left picture correspond to the, those coefficients, and you see that the the values of the black dots are higher. So that means that to represent threes in my data, I'm favoring the first feature vector and the fourth feature vector. To represent sevens, on the other hand, you see that the coefficients which are marked as red are higher than the black ones. And so you see that in order to represent the seven, the uh, feature vectors uh, two, three, and five, and six are favored. So somehow I not only see what's in my data, I see the, the proportions on, on in which uh, the different features are appearing in my data and a confirmation of that being the case is by when I'm looking at the age coefficients, I see that that some of the data vectors are, pre are, are represented by the first two uh, on, the, on the left feature vectors and, and the, the other four are representing the rest. Mm -hmm. So plotting a histogram of these values would be also of value. You would see that that there is some sort of uh, bimodal uh, structure in the data. That's because I have two different digits here. OK, so I hope this this clarifies. So um, so here's let me see. Do I have time? I have five minutes. Uh, Four minutes. Yeah, maybe I have time. So, so we can continue with this example. So I start with this example so that you see what I'm going. So here's a here's another application of um, uh, of my um, non-negative matrix factorization. It's related to community detection. So, so, so I'm looking at the network, and I'm showing you first the network. So here's the network. So I have one, two, I have six by six, 30, 36 uh, nodes in my network. And the uh, <clears throat> nodes are connected by by links, and I have denoted by red, blue, and green communities of the nodes. So the red nodes are connected to each other, the green nodes are connected to each other, the, the blue nodes are connected to each other. But there is no link between the red and blue, and blue and green. And then there are some nodes which are not connected to anything, and so. My question is, can I detect which nodes are uh, connected to each other if I just follow a random walk in this um, this network? So random walk means, let's go back here. I have nodes uh, V, which are V1 to Vn, so these are the dots. And then I have edges, and each edge is characterized by which nodes it connects. I have the adjacency matrix, which is telling which nodes are connected. So adjacency matrix has one in an entry uh, at ij if node i and node j are connected by an edge and zero elsewhere. So A tells me which nodes are connected to each other. And so when I have this network, it's easy to see what the what the A matrix look like. It's, it's, a, it's a 36 by 36 matrix. And for instance, if this is no, node one and this is node two, so there is one in the in the in the position one two. Since I don't have any links from from a uh, um, node to itself, uh, the diagonal of my adjacency matrix is zero. So so I assume that no node is connected to each other. And so then I'm looking at a random walk here. So I'm I'm starting a random walk somewhere, and the random walk can walk from node to node only if there is a link. And so when I'm doing this random work, I'm registering uh, with a random number, uh, which is telling me uh, that a node has been visited. So so maybe I, I should go this slowly next time, but I, I give you quickly the idea what I'm doing. So so um, I'm showing this picture here. So and then uh, next uh, Thursday, I'm going through the details so that you see see everything. So 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 this this picture here is is a result of a random walk. So I started with let's say maybe with this this white dot here, and then my random walk started to walk and it walked around. And every time it visits a node, I add a small uh, contribution to an indicator vector telling that this this node has been visited. 
And so the darker the dot is, the more times the dot has been visited by this random walk. And these random walks are of a finite length. So I'm taking only L indices. I'm taking a random walk of L steps. Okay. And so my, my indicator vector is a random vector also, so that the, the uh, number that I'm adding to the indicator vector is not a deterministic number, but a random number drawn from, from distribution 0, 1. And so based on this sort of data, I'm trying to recognize the communities in my, my network. Okay, so I will not go all the details now because I don't have time to explain it in, in detail. So I will continue with this example on Thursday. And so, so we'll, we'll see this example and then we are going to look at uh, uh, <clears throat> text mining problem also, which is, which is one of the applications that the Nature paper that promoted this NMF was, was talking about. OK, so but that's on, on Thursday, so so we'll continue here and thanks for for joining today and uh, we'll see you on Thursday at uh, the same time. OK, thanks everybody. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yes. Eki, this is Daniela. Can I take just five or ten minutes of your time to ask you something about LDA? Yeah, of course. Yes, now that uh, Okay, I, I yeah. wait for uh, the other people leaving this, this meeting. Also, somebody should uh, stop recording. Maria Stella, please.